From its inception in 2000, Ultimate Spider-Man remains one of the most celebrated and beloved renditions of the friendly neighbourhood superhero. Created by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley, this modern interpretation of Peter Parker's early years as the costume crime fighter ushered in an exciting new era for the Marvel character. For an entire generation of readers, this book was the gateway into Spider-Man's trials and tribulations, and it still has a huge significance on how the wall crawler is presented both in and out of the printed page. Due to Ultimate Spider-Man being set outside of Marvel's classic continuity and being a clear attempt to ground the hero's stories in the new millennium, this series introduced several drastic reinventions of seminal Spidey villains throughout its initial 14-year run. From the hulking devil-like Green Goblin, to the clear blue Electro, to the telekinetic Dog Ock, Bendis and Bagley used this clean slate to experiment with many of Peter's deadliest foes. But, in my opinion, there is no reinvention more noteworthy or historically significant than Venom. First appearing in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 37, this new take on Eddie Brock and the alien symbiote would be unlike anything readers had ever seen before, and would provide not only a horrifying new take on one of Spider-Man's greatest villains, but one of the unquestionable highlights of the entire Ultimate Spider-Man run. The Ultimate Venom Saga is one of the most fondly remembered arcs in the comics decade plus history, and in this video, I want to explain the history behind how this story came to be, discuss the behind the scenes factors behind Ultimate Venom's creation, and how Bendis and Bagley sought to change everything fans knew about Eddie Brock and his deadly alter ego, as well as how this storyline has stood the test of time and influenced our modern understanding of both Spider-Man and Venom still today. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. Ultimate Spider-Man was a massive success upon its September 2000 debut. This fresh take on Peter Parker quickly enamoured itself with readers, and was created as part of a all new universe that sought to reimagine Marvel's heroes for the new millennium. The first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man introduced Peter, his family and close friends, showcased him gaining his powers after being bitten by a genetically modified spider, the death of Uncle Ben, and Peter's transformation into the heroic Spider-Man, along with the emergence of his first villain, the Green Goblin. In just seven issues, Bendis and Bagley set out the entire status quo for Ultimate Spider-Man, as well as outlining the style that would come to define this series over the next 14 years. In the immediate aftermath though, the comic would go from strength to strength. The creative team would introduce a slew of new and reimagined villains, such as the Kingpin, Doctor Octopus and Kraven the Hunter, as well as bringing in key supporting characters like Gwen Stacy and Nick Fury, while simultaneously expanding on the interpersonal drama between the likes of Peter, MJ and Harry Osborn. However, by late 2002, Bendis began considering what the next big story arc for Ultimate Spider-Man would be. Although plans were in place to introduce a version of the Sinister Six, a team of the wall crawlers' deadliest foes, in a seven-issue crossover series with the Ultimates, the writer began to consider which other yet-to-be-seen villains could be drafted in for that year's big story. While Bendis contemplated various ideas, Bill Jemis, then Marvel Vice President, proposed that the team bring Venom into the series. Created by David McElhaney and Todd McFarlane, Venom had become one of Spider-Man's most iconic foes, and had evolved in recent years from one of his key antagonists to a popular character in his own right, transitioning into an anti-hero in McElhaney's 1993 series, The Lethal Protector. With Venom firmly faced as one of Spider-Man's most well-known adversaries, Jim has pushed for the duo to create an ultimate version of him. However, Bendis initially resisted, having been an outspoken critic of the character in his early career and having no strong desire to write about him. As he explained in an interview with CBR, I believe this was the last year Bill Jemis was with Marvel. He came to me and said, you've gotta do Venom. I had already in the press said, Venom sucks. He's the worst. I'll never do Venom. I thought about it though, and there was something visually striking about Venom. I had to come to terms with the fact that these type of villains don't suck. 
they just get overdone or led astray. There's something interesting about them initially, and that's why they got so overblown. I remember how excited I was when I saw Spider-Man's black costume, so I went back to what that felt like and developed this story. Despite his initial reluctance, Bendis accepted that due to Venom's popularity, he had little choice but to adapt the character eventually, and with no time like the present, he began to devise ways on how to reinvent Eddie Brock to fit into the world of Ultimate Spider-Man. Despite the fact that Eddie had made a cameo appearance in an earlier issue, he and Bagley fully went back to the drawing board, seeking to devise wholly new versions of both Eddie and the alien symbiote that possesses both himself and Peter. Originally, Jemis had pitched the idea that Venom could have been created out of Peter's web fluid, but Bendis sternly rejected this and instead looked to tie the villain more closely to the history of the Parker family. Specifically, the writer had been considering how to further explore the secrets of Richard Parker, Peter's biological father and the circumstances behind his disappearance. Unlike the traditional Earth 616 depiction where he and his wife Mary were spies, Bendis reworked the character into a scientist, thereby linking him with Peter's encounter with the spider as well as Oscorp's experiments with DNA. Explaining how this concept came to be, Bendis noted that I went about this story and started reading the DNA book that had come out that year. It was about what was trying to be accomplished with DNA in the modern sciences, and I thought, what's the coolest and most heroic thing that Richard Parker could be trying to do when he died? It was to cure cancer. Then, what's the worst thing that could happen out of all of this? He accidentally creates venom instead, and dies trying to stop it. Now, you've got yourself an epic Peter story that no 15-year-old could possibly rise to. Having developed this unique take on Richard Parker, Bendis immediately realized how Venom could be worked into these plans. In Peter's search for answer for his parents' disappearance, he would discover that Richard, along with his lab partner, Eddie Brock Sr., had created the symbiote as a cure for cancer, turning this once alien creature into an unexpected birthright for the young superhero. As such, beginning in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 33, Marvel would begin to delve deeper into the history of the Parker family, as Peter explores his father's shocking past and the mysterious substance he leaves behind, as well as how this strange black entity pushes Spider-Man to the edge of his morality and results in the creation of one of his most fearsome and lethal foes. The Ultimate Venom Saga opens in a fairly unexpected way, with Peter lying on his basement floor, lamenting his recent breakup with Mary Jane Watson. As he ponders his mistakes, Peter notices a secret door behind a bookcase, and upon entering the room, he discovers boxes belonging to his deceased father. Within the boxes, Peter finds a tape containing old footage of a day out between the Parker family and the Brocks. As Peter watches the video, Aunt May is stood behind him. Emotional at seeing Uncle Ben on this tape, May encourages Peter to track down Eddie Brock explaining that they were childhood friends whose parents both died around the same time, suggesting that he give Eddie a copy of the tape. Peter learns that Eddie now studies at Empire State University, and the two childhood friends reconnect over coffee. Upon handing Eddie the tape though, Brock explains that he also has something to show Peter, as the two travel to the campus science labs, where Eddie reveals a locker containing a mysterious black substance. Eddie states that this was a secret project that both of their fathers were working on together, a suit that can use the wearer's DNA to cure cancer. Amazed by this, Peter offers to help Eddie further study the suits, in the hope that they can finish their parents' research and create something that could save millions of lives. Over the next week, we see Peter, Eddie, and Gwen Stacy research into Richard Parker's notes, learning that he used his own DNA to program the suit, meaning that it recognizes a connection with Peter, and that Trask Industries were attempting to steal their work prior to Richard and Eddie Brock Sr.'s deaths. This revelation inspires Peter to continue his father's research, working long into the night, running tests on the substance. However, upon doing so, he discovers the black goo latching onto him, quickly becoming engulfed by it as it spreads across his body. Peter passes out, and when he wakes up, he finds himself now completely covered in the suit, now taking the form of a black Spider-Man costume. Believing that the symbiote can read his mind due to their connection, Peter ventures into the city to test its capabilities. After swinging through the streets, he notices the shocker attempting to rob a bank. 
and it's upon fighting him that Peter realises that this suit has significantly amplified his superpowers. He quickly defeats Shocker and for a moment, Peter feels incredibly empowered by the suit. But things quickly take a turn for the worse when after trying to apprehend a mugger, Peter is overwhelmed by memories of Uncle Ben's death, causing him to lose control as the symbiote takes on a more monstrous form. The suit urges Peter to kill the mugger, causing the hero to fight off its influence and return to the lab to try and remove it. While Eddie watches the news of Spider-Man's rampage on TV, Peter arrives at his dorm, urging him to destroy every sample of the symbiote and not continue the ongoing research. Reluctantly, Eddie agrees and the two friends set fire to their existing samples in the lab. As Peter returns home though, knocked by the rage and anger that the suit unearthed in him, Brock sneaks back into the lab, retrieving an extra sample that he had kept hidden and now aware of the symbiote's immense power, attempts to bond with it. The next day, Peter meets up with MJ and the pair attempt to reconnect. But as they return to school, Peter senses danger and notices a hulking figure standing on the football pitch. Coming face to face with this terrifying creature, he quickly realises that this is Eddie, having bonded with the suit and allowing it to fully feed off his rage and bitterness towards the world. Peter tries to reach out and talk to his friend, but Eddie yells that Peter tried to destroy his last remaining connection to his family and almost wasted their inheritance due to his own fear and inadequacy. This leads to a fight between the pair, with Eddie spawning tendrils and tentacles as Peter attempts to lure him away from the school. Eventually, Peter realises that much like fire, the suit is vulnerable to electricity, using loose cables and wires to try and slow Venom down as the NYPD arrives and opens fire on them both. Peter manages to escape, but Eddie trips on a loose electrical cable, causing a massive sonic explosion, and when the dust settles, Eddie is nowhere to be found. The next day, Peter meets with S.H.I.E.L.D. director Nick Fury, expressing guilt over seemingly killing his childhood friend and asking Fury to take away his powers. Nick rejects this though, telling Peter that he has a responsibility to use his powers for good and that they're counting on him to join the Ultimates once he's an adult. Following this, Peter goes to Eddie's dorm, desperate to find proof that he's alive, only to be met by his roommate, who explains that Brock must have moved out late last night in a hurry. With no sign of his former friend, Peter sits atop the rooftop of the Empire State Science Labs, contemplating where Eddie is and if he's now at peace or on a quest for vengeance. Just as he does though, he's suddenly startled, but turns round only to see the night sky staring back at him, leaving Peter alone to reflect on the complicated legacy of his father's creation and the burden of responsibility he feels for letting such a lethal threat loose into the world. Following the end of Ultimate Spider-Man issue 39, Peter would move on from the Venom saga. However, the events of this story would have a major impact on his character and his world. Although Eddie Brock wouldn't reappear for some time, this bout with his close friend turned arch enemy, along with the revelation of his father's research, would force Peter into an intense period of self-reflection, eventually resulting in his reconciliation with Mary Jane and vowing to become both a better hero and a better person. It would also be revealed that Peter and Dr. Kirk Connors would quietly continue testing the remaining traces of the symbiote. And as the two men grow closer, Connors discovers Peter's secret identity even treating his wounds after a vicious battle with the gladiator. In an attempt to fix the symbiote's flaws, Connors and his assistant Ben Riley secretly mix the black substance with Peter's DNA, eventually creating a brand new symbiote. This second symbiote would be teased in Ultimate Spider-Man issue 60 from June 2004, before formally debuting over the next five issues. Here, this symbiote known as Carnage grows into a sentient creature, retaining many of Peter's memories and seeking to bond itself with a host. After escaping from Dr. Connor's lab, the symbiote travels to Peter's home, attaching itself to Gwen Stacy. However, instead of bonding with her like the Venom symbiote, Carnage instead absorbs Gwen's fluids and kills her. After discovering his best friend dead, Peter tracks down Carnage to exact revenge, with the organism taking the form of Richard Parker before Peter is able to destroy it. This Carnage storyline would act as a spiritual successor to the original Ultimate Venom saga, building off Peter's anxieties towards his father's work reappearing and the symbiote seemingly taking away two of Peter's closest friends. 
In addition to this, Eddie Brock would also return in the Pages of Ultimate Spider-Man issue 123 from June of 2008, but the character would actually reappear first in a canonical story told outside of the comics. You see, in September 2005, Activision released the Ultimate Spider-Man video game. This game would be set three months after the conclusion of the original Venom story arc, showcasing what happens to Eddie Brock in the time after his apparent death. In the game, players control both Spider-Man and Venom within an open world setting, as Trask Industries hunt both Peter and Eddie. Throughout the game, we see Brock battling to keep the symbiote under control, as we also learn that because Peter initially bonded with the suit, he carries part of Venom in his bloodstream. Bolivar Trask, seeking to weaponize the symbiote, hires a team of mercenaries led by Silver Sable to capture the pair, leading to a climax where Peter is experimented on and transformed into Carnage, forcing Eddie to fight his former friend and absorb the symbiote from him. The game's conclusion sees a much larger Venom with glowing red eyes and a white spider emblem disappear, as Peter uncovers a secret file about his parents' death, revealing that a symbiote was present when they were killed. Much of this game's story would be adapted into the War of the Symbiote storyline that ran throughout Ultimate Spider-Man issue 123 to 128, and these issues would serve as Eddie Brock's final appearance in Earth 1610, with our last sighting of the character being him getting captured by the Beetle and transported to Latveria. While this version of Eddie wouldn't reappear on the printed page, another version of Venom would be later introduced in 2012, in the form of Conrad Marcus, a Roxxon scientist responsible for creating the spider that bit Miles Morales. After Miles gains powers and succeeds Peter as Spider-Man, Marcus steals the Venom symbiote and bonds with it, seeking to kill the new Spider-Man. Now, this version of Venom is depicted as far larger and less human-like than Eddie Brock, with a more alien design, heavily resembling that of a giant Z. Marcus's Venom doesn't stick around for long though, as he's killed following a battle with Miles, where he's separated from the suit and then shot by a swarm of police. Most recently, the Ultimate Symbiote briefly reappeared in Donny Cates' run on Venom, when the maker, the Earth 1610 version of Reed Richards, obtained it and used it to try and return to his original Earth, only to find it left in ruins. Even though the Ultimate Universe is in the midst of a relaunch under the direction of Jonathan Hickman, and a brand new Ultimate Spider-Man series is set to begin in early 2024, it so far remains unclear if either Eddie Brock or Venom will appear in this new comic, leaving the future currently uncertain for this unique version of the Lethal Protector. With just over 20 years now since this story's inception, the Venom saga remains one of the most well-remembered parts of the original Ultimate Spider-Man comic series. In only seven issues, Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley completely reimagined the story of Eddie Brock and transformed the symbiote from a faraway alien substance found by Peter on Battleworld to a harrowing reminder of what his father's legacy can become when it falls into the wrong hands. At the time, this was a revolutionary take on Venom. Although the character had become extremely popular in the 1990s and 2000s, we hadn't seen a writer attempt such a daring reimagining. By linking the suit to Peter's search for answers regarding his parents' disappearance, to making him and Eddie Brock long-lost friends, to that iconic shot of the two standing face-to-face -face in the rain on the Midtown football pitch, this storyline has continued to influence our understanding of the relationship between Spider-Man and Venom to this day. From Mark Bagley's design alone, it's evident that this is a much different version of the Lethal Protector that fans had grown accustomed to over the past 20 years. Bagley, who had drawn much of Venom's Lethal Protector run in the 1990s, explained the process of tweaking the character's design to reflect this new take on the character, telling Sci-Fi Wire that, I knew it couldn't have the white spider on his chest, although I made a pitch for it. The idea being that it had, like, muscle memory from when it was on Peter for a short while, but Brian didn't really want to do that. So I kind of came at it with the idea that it would be less like a prototypical supervillain body. If you really look at the way I drew the Venom creature, he's more of a monster. He's more of a big, old, cancerous thing walking around. As it got later on in the story, he had teeth growing out of his shoulder, out of his forearms. Things were just out of control, so that was my idea of it. Venom has always existed as a dark mirror to Spider-Man, a living manifestation of what he could become if he gave up on his morals and responsibility. 
Here in Ultimate Spider-Man, Bendis takes this concept a step further, turning Eddie Brock into Peter's childhood friend and a fellow orphan with a love of science, showcasing that this is what our hero could grow into if not for having Aunt May, Uncle Ben and his obligations as the web slinger. However, this isn't to say that Bendis' characterization of Venom is flawless. It's no secret that the writer had been an open critic of the character earlier in his career, and despite essentially rebuilding Eddie from the ground up, several parts of this story haven't aged particularly well. Most notably, while Peter is researching the black suit and eventually bonds with it, there's a subplot that sees Eddie making advances on Gwen Stacy, despite him being an adult at college while Gwen is still in high school. To call Eddie a creep in this story would be a huge understatement, and while the uncomfortableness readers felt towards him may be by design, it likely isn't something that long-term fans of Venom would appreciate. Additionally, although the climactic fight between Peter and Venom is excellent, and one of the most instantly recognisable sequences in any issue of Ultimate Spider-Man, I was surprised by how little time Peter actually spends wearing the black suit. Over the entirety of seven issues, we only get one issue that focuses on Peter wearing the symbiote. Contrast this to the original story arc from the 1980s, where Peter returns home in Amazing Spider-Man 252 for May of 1984, and continues wearing it until Spectacular Spider-Man 99 the following February. Alongside this, Venom wasn't even introduced for another four years, with the character only being revealed in Amazing Spider-Man 300 for May of 1988. Now, while I'm not suggesting that Bendis and Bagley should have stretched the storyline out to that extent, the fact that the entire black suit story was told in just a few months and then Venom was rarely seen after it is a surprising oversight by the creative team and feels like a missed opportunity to further explore what Eddie Brock's role would be in this drastically different version of the Marvel Universe. Even though I would still contend that this is a story fondly remembered for good reason, it should have been the starting point for a more nuanced investigation into Venom. There were ample stories to be told about how Eddie fares with the symbiote whilst on the run, his potential transition into a lethal protector, and even how the death of Peter and Miles Morales becoming Spider-Man would affect him. As it stands though, besides the video game and the War of the Symbiote arc that occurred five years later, Eddie wasn't ever seen again in an Ultimate Universe comic. And while another version of Venom did appear several years later, he only made a small handful of appearances before being killed off and was largely a very forgettable character. And I think it's this that, above all else, makes the Ultimate Venom saga feel like a tale of missed opportunity and wasted potential. And revisiting it two decades later only highlights the complicated history of this once promising iteration of one of Marvel's most unique and complex characters. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on this video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and hopefully I will see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.